All right. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Corey Callahan. I am associated with the Center for Ecosystem Science at Bees, and uh, my co-presenter slash organizer is Maureen Thompson. So she's doing a PhD student with Jody Rowley and myself, and we're look, looking at some of these questions that we'll be talking about. Um, I'm actually in Germany now, so it's it's actually 6.20 in the morning. So I guess good morning from my side of things. Um, our, our goal here, well, first I need to tell you that I think we're gonna record this as requested by the Citizen Science Association. So I'm going to start that now. It's already recording, Corey. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, and so the, the program for the next hour and a little bit, is so uh, Maureen and I were going to just kind of give a little bit of a presentation on this idea of adaptive sampling and give you some kind of uh, hot off the press results of some stuff that we've been working on. And then we're going to go into like a little bit of a break, some breakout rooms. Um, looks like we have about 20 participants, so maybe three to four breakout rooms and just kind of have a little bit of a discussion. And I'm really keen to get some feedback on what people think about this idea of adaptive sampling in citizen science projects. So with that, I will go ahead and get started. Let's see, so yeah, so as we all know, you know, citizen science is crazy increasing, um, lots and lots of data. This is, this is really, you know, it's really great news, but there's still lots of biases. Um, and so this is really with a focus on biodiversity data. So this is just showing that birds are way overrepresented to a lot of other taxa. Um, this is showing biases in space across the world with GDP, for instance. So countries with the highest GDP tend to have the highest observations um, as well as per capita. Um, so, to, you know, and this is potentially an issue for some things. And so this is where this idea of adaptive sampling comes in. So we know that the um, data are increasing, but how can we make it better? And the term adaptive sampling, I actually got from a colleague, Michael Pocock from the UK. Um, I'm not entirely sure where he came, where it came from or where it was originally coined, but the idea is sampling biodiversity to optimize the value of a given sampling event based on previously collected data. Um, so it's kind of like this whole idea of adaptive management where you're constantly updating your goals, um, but with the, with the notion of collection, collecting citizen science data. The, the, the key here is, is how do you know what samples are valuable, quote unquote, which is, you, you know, kind of tricky and it's also quite subjective. And so first I just want to give you two case studies of kind of how this might be possible to try to understand what samples are better or you know, most valuable. Um, so the first is this question, how should biodiversity sampling be conducted that is best for understanding population trends? So you know, this is very simple stuff. We wanna know the population trend of these four Sydney region birds through time. So we used eBird data starting from 2010 to 2019 you know, and the gray gray lines represent the 95% confidence intervals. So we're pretty darn confident that noisy minor is increasing in the region. Mask lapwing, we really don't know, right? Those confidence intervals could represent an increase, a decrease. It could have no, no change. We're somewhat confident that hard heads are decreasing, but to what extent, we're just really not sure. And these data, they get better with time, but also the number of observations. So this should this is showing just as you get as you increase time, almost immediately that gray confidence interval decreases, and then eventually we kind of end up with this really clear pattern and a you know and you can still see the confidence interval decreasing through time. So I won't dwell on this too much because it's a bit statistical. But how do we quantify the value of an observation? We used something called statistical leverage. So leverage is a measure of how far away the independent variable values of an observation are from those of the other observations. So essentially, if you have a bunch of data points, how important every single given data point is to that model fit. Um, high leverage points are those that are made at extreme or outlined values of the independent variable. 
So if you just kind of think of it visually, let's just pretend these are our fictional data points and this yellow line is our linear model fit. But then if you add another data point that's kind of an outlier, that has a really strong influence because it pulls this second fictional model fit up to a large extent. And so this, this becomes this high leverage data point that changes the trend. So to test this, we used eBERT throughout the greater Sydney region. And we had some kind of predictions for each of these um, grid cells. We, we calculated the, the following, the number of days since the last sample, the median sampling interval. So how frequently a, a sample comes from a given grid cell, the nearest neighbor sampling interval, the number of unique days sampled, and the distance to the nearest sampled grid. So for those grids that have no samples at all, how far away are the nearest sampled grids? And we did, we basically ran through all this analysis that I won't go into detail on to try to test which of these patterns were the most important for predicting the value using this kind of leverage as a way to quantify the value of a given eBird observation. Um, and the, the takeaway here, so the five, 10, 25, 50 are the different grain sizes which largely um, correspond with one another. And then the, the, the things that we tested are on the y-axis. And then these are the parameter estimates on the x-axis and zero means no influence. So the further away, the more positive the relationship. So consistently the number of unique days sampled was actually one of the most important predictors of the value of the, of the following observation, as well as the distance to the nearest sampled grid and to some extent, the median sampling interval. And so our kind of takeaway here is that actually it's not just about filling in the kind of cold spots or where samples aren't from. Hot spots are almost equally, if not more important for future sampling, if you're trying to understand biodiversity trends. Um, and then where it gets really cool is that you can use this kind of these 10 years of data to then predict in the future in this dynamic framework of if you have all the samples come tomorrow, well, what about the next day? Where, where are the most valuable places to sample following that? So this just shows the value map throughout the greater Sydney region of, a, of the checklist. And you can kind of see some differences um, throughout the region. And this is potentially a better way to look at it because this is, this is just 10 random grid cells that are throughout the greater Sydney region and the value changed through time. So you can see this one, it's, you know, this purple line here, all of a sudden someone samples and the value decreases. The blue line generally just not that important or valuable and it doesn't really change through time. But then you see some of these with some really interesting patterns where, so for instance, this red line, the value kind of increases because no one samples and then someone samples and it decreases. Then again, it kind of increases because no one sampled in that cell, someone samples and then it decreases. And you kind of get these really interesting dynamic changes through time. And this is what we're trying to think about as, as far as an adaptive sampling framework. And here's just a visualization um, of the greater Sydney region for every day of the year. And you can kind of see this purple is kind of flashing throughout. So someone finally sampled here, so it drops the value down. Um, these are some of the remote parts of the greater Sydney region. So it's kind of as you'd expect. But then again, someone samples, so the value drops down. Um, so it, the idea is to push users or citizen scientists to these areas that have the highest value. And you can do this in this dynamic framework. And now I'm just gonna give a second case study. Um, so again, that the first one was about population trends very explicitly. And this one's about how should biodiversity sampling be conducted that is best for understanding species assemblages. So taxonomic diversity. And I'll just run through a fictional example. So if you just pretend we have a city, you have two you know, national parks that are equidistant from this city. Um, for whatever reason, you know, maybe there's more biodiversity in Park B or you know, I don't know, it's easier to get to Park B. So more people go there. Therefore, we, we know more. So completeness, just think of this as kind of our knowledge. So we can, quant and you can quantify this. Let's say we know seven, we, we estimate that we have quantified 75% of the biodiversity in Park B and only 25% of the biodiversity in Park A. So if I ask you where should we kind of direct sampling, where should the priority be? Most people are probably going to say Park A. And I wouldn't dis disagree with that. But 
often we have another layer of data that we can kind of think to conceptualize this with. And that is the risk, right? So, you know, in this kind of conservation world, Park B might be under really significant threat as far as development goes, whereas Park A might be might have very low threat. And so if, then if I ask where the priority should be, I actually would argue that it is in Park B because this 25% that's missing is more important than the 75%. Essentially, it can wait. The prioritization should be shifted towards this area with a high threat because we need to understand what could potentially be lost for offset mitigation, et cetera, kind of as urgently as possible. And so I tested this, you know, and you can kind of um, conceptualize this into two, two dimensions. So the average completeness and the risk of habitat conversion and then sampling priority is lowest down here. So here we already have biodiversity data established and here it's really high risk of habitat conversion, but we don't know, we know very little about the biodiversity in that region. So average completeness, very low. Um, and so the idea would be to shift points that fall in this region to the, this other, to the other side of the one-to-one -one line. So I tested this with some real data using eBird, um, some survey completeness, and this was kind of a global analysis using grid cells throughout the world, and also some risk classification for different um, grid cells. So I put those data in this conceptual framework, and then, took that and, and then you can actually assign value to every one of those grid cells. So again, you have here, you have really high average completeness and low risk of habitat conversion. Those are the lowest priority cells kind of on a global basis. And then you can map this and it, you know, it basically shows that large regions of Africa, um, some of South America, some in Southeast Asia and are generally the areas with the lowest, with, sorry, with the highest sampling priority on a global scale. So those were really just two, uh, you know, the idea here was just to give you two examples of what we mean by this adaptive sampling. And so first you need to understand theoretically how you could do it. And so here, these were just two examples. There's many, many ways that hopefully we can discuss in the um, discussion group afterwards. But the next work is to understand kind of to what extent people actually adopt or follow suggestions. And in order to do this, we kind of took two approaches using Frog ID as a, you know, this kind of case study throughout Australia. We first surveyed participants, which Maureen's going to talk to you about. And then we experimentally tested the willingness to adopt these kind of nudges, which I'll show a few results on as well. Um, okay, now I think I'm going to stop sharing really quickly and switch to Maureen. Um, okay. Awesome. Thanks, Maureen. Um, someone asked for that citation of the ecography paper, if you... Yeah, I'll, I'll flash it through. Okay, great. Okay, great. So now I'm going to talk about the motivations and behavior of citizen science participants and their implications for biodiversity data coverage. Because citizen science doesn't just give us a rich source of information about the natural world, it's also a great way to learn about human behavior. So as the first part in an experiment testing if and how participants can be motivated to collect data more optimally, we wanted to understand what motivates them to contribute the way they do now. So no surprise to anyone here, biodiversity data collected through citizen science initiatives has increased exponentially in recent years. Though often these data sets are described as being heavily biased by things like weather, timing, site accessibility, and desirability. While this is true, it's also true of museum specimens and professionally collected data. So they're not unique, but these biases do exist, which means um, our understanding of biodiversity and risk is limited. So these biases are assumed to be part and parcel of the citizen science programs. They're larger with unstructured programs and they're more surmountable with um, more structured programs. But currently the extent to which people are willing to alter their behavior for the benefit of a project is largely unknown. 
So I'll talk about what that means a little bit. Black dots on screen are eBird data, and it's also sort of a de facto map of the metropolitan areas and road networks in Australia, because that's where people are, so that's where they collect data. And we wanna know if prompted, if people would collect data from some of these white areas. And for a temporal example, um, this is a multi-year heat map of Crinia sloanii calls, um, an Australian frog. So if we just look at 2018, um, it looks like they don't call um, during the month of May, but we don't know if this is evidence of absence or an absence of evidence. And so as people put more effort in, we can see that they do call during May and they also actually call during April. Um, so this is like an opportunity to fill in temporal data gaps. And by 2020, we have a more robust picture of the species actual calling period. So that's what I'm gonna be talking about now is like what would uh, motivate people to fill in data gaps like this. So working with Corey and Adam and several other collaborators, we developed a questionnaire grounded in self-determination theory and other literature that addresses motivations for volunteering. So we included themes from this self-determination continuum, like um, are you intrinsically motivated? Like you just are in it for the fun. You directly enjoy what you get out of the experience. When things like integrated and identified regulation are more like you're doing it because it uh, aligns with your sense of self and your values. Things like conserving frogs or contributing to science. And introjected regulation is like um, sort of an internally regulated um, reward system, like adding new species to your personal list. And external regulation is you enjoy um, sort of the engagement you get with others and um, like competing against other people. So with some of these themes in mind, we ask people what motivates them, what limits their participation to describe their current use, how often they record frogs and how far they travel to do so, what would motivate them to change their behavior. And we pose potential changes to the app to see how that would influence people's level of interest. And we collected some demographic info. So a lot of our questions look like this. It's a Likert matrix commonly used to present multi-item scales. So like on a scale of not interested at all to extremely interested, how much do you want this ice cream? And then you fill in the dot that best corresponds with your answer. So we sent the survey out to um, the 30,000 registered frog ID users and we received 1,200 responses. So usually it's presented separately that project managers are interested in maximizing conservation and scientific gains and to a lesser degree interested in increasing participant scientific literacy and social and civic engagement. While participants are interested in personal gain, recognition and feedback, um, personal interest, and to a lesser degree, opportunities for advocacy and community involvement. But here we see conserving frogs and contributing to science were overwhelmingly the most commonly reported motivations for participating. So on that five point scale, you can see a lot of very important to somewhat important on screen. Um, and this went ranked well above self-improvement and enjoyment related themes like education and fun. And at the bottom, we see opportunities to network and engage with community. So really people's reported motivations are in line with the stated aims of the program. But in terms of relating this to behavior, there is a lot of research that looks at um, the citizen science program's impact on participant behavior, but usually it measures something like outside of the project itself, things like lifestyle choices, political participation, social engagement proximal to that field. So it gets to some of the secondary aims of citizen science projects, but doesn't connect directly to the aims of biodiversity data collection. Um, so to address this, we asked a series of prompts about what would interest people to change where and when they collect data. 
And overwhelmingly, people were interested. Uh, specifically, they were interested in regular accessible investments and proof that what they're doing matters. So visiting important places, um, visiting a place regularly, um, basically things that are in line with their stated motives. And while some studies have found that more active participants were uh, more intrinsically motivated, meaning they were rewarded by their own sense of achievement and um, yeah, satisfaction. Other studies have found that by increasing the gamification and competitive aspects of a platform, they were able to increase user retention and contribution rates. But here we see not only were respondents less interested in competition than all of these other prompts, but they were potentially turned off by the opportunity to change um, their behavior in response to a competitive challenge. So you can see a lot more, you know, somewhat unlikely or extremely unlikely than we've seen in response to any of these other prompts. Along similar lines, we asked about building up and adding elements to Frog ID's leaderboard, which is the existing competition community space because we wanted to understand how engagement through the platform influences participation rates. And um, we see high interest in things that relate specifically to the program goals and people's part in it, collecting data on species and places that are known to add value. But in general, people were not super interested. Um, you can see a lot more gray and yellow on the screen. Um, many people said they would lose interest in the project if some of these community competitive elements were added. And interestingly, again, we see competition related prompts um, were at least popular and most likely to cause people to lose interest. So we collected all this information on people's motivations and behavior. So I wanted to see if on a personal level, there were differences like in how those aligned, like are people who express a greater interest in contribution contributing less frequently now, meaning they're not being engaged in the style that would interest them? Or are people who are motivated by conservation more likely to be willing to change their behavior than someone who's interested in say fun? Because um, you know, they're interested in that secondary satisfaction, not just like the primary satisfaction of engaging in the app the way they like. But um, surprisingly, there wasn't a huge story here. Basically, the results presented so far are robust across motivation types and frequent and infrequent users, which is a surprise to me. But also, it's partly because all respondents or 99% of respondents said they were motivated by conservation. Um, so there wasn't really an outgroup to sample. But in terms of um, other differences across respondents, research has highlighted the importance of understanding the demographic data of participants to address gaps and maximize breadth of participation across society. And we did find that uh, basically the younger people were, the more open to change they are. So you can see on screen here, um, ages 18 to 24 and respondents 25 to 34 in sort of aqua and royal blue are um, riding this density plot over towards the I would be very interested side. Well, um, the older people are, the more likely they are to lose interest if these changes were made. And the same was true with regard to prompts of the leaderboard. Um, it basically cascades across by age group. So the younger people are, the more interested they are in these changes, including to come which we know was unpopular from a couple slides ago. And the older people are, the more likely they are to lose interest if um, these changes were added. So that's interesting, but um, it's important to note that these respondents are also a small part of the whole. And so if this represents the frog ID community at large, it means that making changes to grow this demographic also runs the risk of um, turning off Frog ID's demonstrated user base, which is generally people 45 and older. Because we know there's a difference between stated and revealed behavior, just like the difference between polling and voting. And what we've done so far is basically polling. 
but our superpower is we are on the Frog ID team. And so we have access to the backend data. And as I mentioned at the beginning, this was a preliminary step in an experiment in data optimization. So over the past year, we have been running an experiment um, where Frog IG users and several LGAs have access to a map like this one in the Central Coast that shows the value of their recordings based on a species accumulation curve specific to each five kilometer grid cell and refresh every two weeks. So we've been incorporating the results of this survey into our communication tactics to see if the actual behavior change aligns with what we would expect based on the results presented here. Um, so we can calibrate our expectations for Frog ID and um, for other citizen science biodiversity programs with the ultimate goal of improving data quality. Um, so that project has been running for a year and it's actually wrapping up this month, which is really exciting. So I'm gonna pass it back over to Corey, who's gonna talk about some of the details of that experiment and some preliminary results. Fantastic, thanks Maureen. So yep, as she said, this is um, kind of, we, we launched this about just over a year ago now, and I'll just give you very, just very briefly some preliminary results, just quickly, just a little bit of background. Um, what we tried to do was we selected six LGAs as kind of experimental units um, to run this pilot study on to see if we gave people maps of where we think sampling should occur, will they follow those maps? That was the question. Um, and so we had two control groups. And so these were a priori control groups where we didn't actually tell them anything. We had two where we gave them a website, which is basically the map that Maureen just showed. And then we had two where we gave them a website and a leaderboard. Um, the, the key here was that that leaderboard didn't have anything to do with the number of observations or the number of species, which is pretty typical in citizen science leaderboards. It was actually focused on how valuable your observations were based on what we dictated the value was. Um, now, we tr just this, these, these stats on the screen are really just trying to illustrate that we tried to choose these LGAs a priori based on similar-ish frog diversity, similar number of participants kind of prior to launching, um, and somewhat similar size in LGAs. Uh, obviously, this was um, somewhat tricky to do, but we did our best and to try to come up with this kind of experimental design. And so this is just a very quick video of what the website looked like, and this website is what we sent to them. So we had this designed, um, we gave a little bit of information about the project, kind of why we would want people to sample differently, and this would be to help our knowledge of frog diversity throughout the region. Uh, a little bit of a tutorial, and as Maureen mentioned, we actually prioritized value in a semi-complicated way using species accumulation curve. So how far along a grid cell was on their species accumulation curve, if it was plateaued, that indicates that it's relatively well sampled and therefore it would get a low priority. But if it's very, it's, if it's steadily increasing, then it would end up with a high priority um, status. And we updated these every two weeks. So as data came in from the Frog ID project were validated by Jody Rowley and her team. Then on the back end, we were able to run rerun our calculations and update this map. So it was kind of a dynamic sense in that it changed every two weeks. Some grid cells could still say stay the same value, obviously, but other grid cells could go from high to low or low to high priority. And then we presented them with this map every two weeks. Um, sorry. Oh, and then the, the difference was with the leaderboard is the same exact thing, except for they had a leaderboard based on um, kind of the, this, this scoring system here that we essentially made up. But the idea was that, you know, one point for sampling in a low priority area, two points in a medium. So it's trying to give effort, you know, a reward effort for getting the high valuable, you know, sample points. And then we displayed this leaderboard on those websites for two of the LGAs. And then the key here was kind of the communication. So Jody Rowley and Nadia and Adam, they all helped with the communication um, and Maureen, where we actually kind of presented them say, hey, look, we have this, you know, pilot study. We hope you'll partake. Here's, an, uh, here's a website. Please check it regularly. 
And we just sent a few reminders. Um, and this was the way we did this is we targeted people that had previously submitted an observation in that LGA that was one of the um, experimental LGAs. So we just sent them an email and we didn't want to bug them too much. So I think we sent three or four emails throughout the entire year and, you know, encouraging them to support. And we allowed them to opt out if we were negging them. Um, and then with the reminder emails, we would show some of the differences. So this is, you know, September, November, and February. And you can see the different changes in the map. So generally the, the high priority, medium priority areas are in the same region but they still do change where, so this one here, for instance, is now low priority when it was medium, then high and now low and just updating this map. And I think from the website, you can see that it's an interactive map. So you can zoom in and figure out where you might wanna go. We had quite a few um, website visits. So our peak was over 150 in a given sampling period. This is just for one of the LGAs, um, but note this kind of somewhat sharp decline. And I think, Part of this is almost certainly impacted by COVID uh, going into lockdown, you know, almost, you know, in the middle of our kind of test case where people really couldn't go that far. So I think these results need to be interpreted with that in mind. But nevertheless, um, you know, we do have some interesting results. So I'm just going to walk through this slowly. So on the y-axis, you have the percentage. So this is gonna be a bar graph and there's six LGAs that I already mentioned. And then these are colored based on the status of those priority cells. And what each one represents is the, the relative sampling of the available cells. So the reason that it's across all, you know, across this LGA, across all time periods, the reason that it's relative sampling is that because there's different areas in each LGA, there's, already an unequal number of cells. So we tried to account for that by making it relative to the number of samples that were available. And so for this, you can interpret it as essentially um, medium, low and high priority cells are, were sampled you know, relatively equally compared to what was available to them in that LGA. Insufficient records is very small and no samples from zero record cells. And here's the rest of the LGAs. So again, you can interpret these similarly. So just as a, as a, you know, so for blue mountains, that means that most of the samples came, a large percentage of the samples came from high priority cells relative to what was available. Very few from low priority and, you know, a small amount from medium priority. And just as a reminder, this, so these two are the controls. This was the one where we presented them a website. So just a map. And this is the one where we presented them the map and the leaderboard. And so, you know, these are these were just made yesterday, so this couldn't be any more preliminary uh, results. But, you know, I think this is somewhat strong evidence that, you know, we are seeing some support that people are following these this adaptive sampling map. So across the entire time period, the, a larger percentage of cells samples came from high priority cells in the experimental with leaderboard and quite a few with the website. Central Coast was a bit of a weird one because this one weird cell and a power user, um, and that happened to just be in medium priority. So we still need to do some playing around, but overall, these results are pretty encouraging that people are willing to follow the maps. Um, the key here is it doesn't have to be that many people, right? In order to make a big difference for biodiversity knowledge, you might only need a few people to sample. And this is something that we still need to test with these data and kind of what percentage of people, of participants, do you need to kind of improve that biodiversity sampling? Um, so yeah, again, the summary, I think based on nudges, I think we have a chance at you know, increasing our biodiversity knowledge. Um, but I just wanna note, this was really a pilot study. And you know, and we worked really closely with the Frog ID team, which has been fantastic. But putting this into practice is necessarily an interdisciplinary approach. And so that's why, you know, we've really come at it from this two prong kind of experimental kind of quantitative, but also from the social side, surveying participants. And this is this is just the beginning of something that I think could really um, help biodiversity data and the future for citizen science use in understanding biodiversity. And with that, I think, um, yep, yeah, so thank you. Um,
I think, are there any questions? I guess we'll take a few questions and then a very short break until four, I think. Is that right, Maureen? Yep. Um, and then we'll rejoin and we'll split into breakout rooms and hopefully just discuss some of these things. And we'd love to get your feedback on kind of your experience with this and motivations for participants and these kinds of things. So hopefully you'll stick around. Um, it looks like we have one question from Oliver already. So do you want to unmute Oliver or type it in the chat? Yep. Thank you, Corey and Maureen. That was fascinating. Um, I was just curious, given this is based on a survey and you're looking at perceptions and changes, I think Maureen said there was roughly 1,200 survey respondents out of 30,000 participants. How do you account for bias actually in your survey respondents out of your total population? Um, you're right, that's a small number out of the whole and like certain people are more likely to respond than other people. Um, but it is actually like above the threshold that we set to reasonably sample this population. I think um, based on like some um, statistical references for like what you should have as your sample population. We wanted to hit 900 people and we got more than that. Um, but you're right, it's not necessarily the same people that are participating. And the other question I might have is your, your responses said that competition is not very important, but the Frog ID leaderboard is really about bragging rights. You don't offer any prizes. Do you think competition would vary if there was prizes behind that competition? It certainly could because, and also like people might not say they're interested in competition, but um, but like when that element is there, you know, it might strike something in you, which is what it looks like. Um, you know, people maybe are, according to some other citizen science literature, interested in gamification things that just make engagement more fun. Yeah. Um, but yeah, certainly the type of competition, like whether it's um, more like everyone has a shared goal or there's like an independent, you know, cutthroat aspect. It definitely changes like the way people engage, whether or not there's um, prizes or just um, notoriety. Thank you. Okay, so if there aren't any other immediate questions, I think we'll just yep, take a very short break for three, four minutes and um, We'll organize into some breakout rooms and we'll just be back in just a couple minutes. That's cool. Thank you. See you in a bit, guys.